and uh, obviously the conversation continues uh, and everyone here is uh, very, very engaged. So thank you all for your contributions. Uh, it's my pleasure to be able to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Ashley Yates. Uh, we're going to have a really nice session of really over the next hour or so, uh, really going through a case and doing some simulation work. Um, and I want to first introduce uh, Ashley. Dr. Yates is the Vice President for Healthcare Quality and the Chief Medical Officer at Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital in Milton. He's been leading their quality and process improvement initiatives, and he's been overseeing the CARE program uh, in association with uh, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and the Silverman Institute for Healthcare Quality. Um, Ashley joined the Harvard Medical Faculty uh, Physician Leadership Team, first as an Associate Chief of Emergency Medicine at uh, Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital in Milton in 2010, and he's gone on to uh, lead the quality improvement and patient safety work there. Uh, Dr. Yates has spoken uh, internationally on quality improvement theory and on building a quality organization. So let me invite uh, Dr. Yates up and he'll introduce uh, his uh, team. Thank you, Evan. Good morning, everybody. I want to thank everyone for, for being here. I really feel like I'm in a room full of heroes. We have uh, patients, we have nurses, we have physicians, and we have uh, patient safety and, and risk management professionals in this room who are committed to this charge. And, and whilst it's true I have spoken internationally on healthcare quality, I do most of that international speaking uh, at work. Um, I'm joined today uh, with uh, the team from Milton. Uh, I am Canadian. Um, my uh, partner in crime <laughs> in all things uh, healthcare quality is, is Alex Campbell, uh, who is uh, Scottish. Uh, uh, David Polinick is with me as well, uh, our risk manager who is American. Uh, and Lynn, Lynn Cronin, our chief nursing officer, is British. So I, I do, most of that happens uh, actually at work. And I'm going to invite them along with Linda Kenny uh, up to speak, um, up to, to answer questions at the end of this discussion. We're going to spend about 45 minutes, and if Michelle's still in the room, she has this really bright red purse. If she could hold that up uh, when I've got about 10 minutes to go, or Alex can give me the wave um, to let me know that it's time to start to wind this down. We're going to go from the, the blunt end of care uh, to the sharp end of, of care uh, and what it's like to actually um, implement uh, a program and the experiences that. Uh, we have gone through in implementing this program at BID Milton. We are an 88-bed hospital. Um, to answer the question, I think, of the last, uh, the last person at the podium, how many people does it take to implement this, there are three of us. <laughs> and we have not added an FTE to do this. Um, although we're not participating in Michelle's formal study because of IRB uh, issues, we are looking at this from a, a healthcare quality perspective. And in the first year of the program, we put over 100 cases through care. Uh, only, which, uh, only three of which uh, were ultimately referred for uh, a care insurer sure protocol. And the lessons learned for, for us in that is this really is truly uh, about communication. Uh, and I'm, I'm going backwards too. So, so um, this is really about I'm sorry. Um, and uh, my, my mother, I come from a family of, of teachers. My mother is a teacher. My father is a professor. They're both retired. That means they have far too many Apple products and a lot of time on their hands. And so they send me countless emails of things that they think I might be interested in. But my mom, my mom sent, me, uh, sent me this just a, a few weeks ago. And I think this is really, really sums up uh, uh, the, the work around Sori. Um, it's one of the, uh, the first things we learn uh, as children. And yet um, it's so hard to do. Um, and it's really the core uh, of this program. Um, the, uh, the, uh, are there any, are there any um, pediatricians in the room? So if you have, don't have a pediatrician, you just turn to a mother, because that's you get the same, the same sort of answer. If I remember my family practice training, I think uh, your first words are, are single words at about age plus one. So around one year old, you, you get these one word sentences, two word sentences. Um, and uh, I, I'm not sure that sorry is the first word that comes out of a child's mouth. Uh, and in fact, my experience with my nephew, it was mine. Um, <laughs> and I, I think that speaks a little bit to the, to the program. It's really understanding the perspectives of clinicians and protecting what is theirs, their professional reputation, their integrity, uh, and then bridging that gap uh, towards, towards Sori. So um, I remember the moment, uh, oh, I'm doing it again, uh, the moment when we uh, became involved in this program. I was in the parking lot of our uh, hospital at about 2.30 uh, on uh, Thursday, the 23rd of August, 2012, and I got a phone call from, from Ken, who has been uh, a real mentor for me, and it went something along the lines of chapter 224, blah, blah, blah. 
we're going to do this disclosure apology thing, and okay, I got my hand on the on the door handle of the car, and he and, and he said, you know, it's really about you know saying sorry when something goes wrong, and I said, yeah, yeah, I, I'm in, I'm in, but Ken, I'm on my way to the airport. I've got a flight to San Francisco at 5:30. Um, I'll, I'll do whatever it is you need, um, but just give the COO a call because I know she's also in too, and she's the one that needs to speak to the CEO to get that buy-in, and then I'll take it from there, not a problem. I was a part-time CMO, so it meant I had no direct reports and no responsibilities as CMO other than to herd cats, work the occasional shift in the emergency department, and take on ad hoc projects, and this was my ad hoc project. And, and it really followed a lot of what Alan and Melinda uh, presented in terms of laying out the conversation with the medical staff and with the board about the importance of this. And it is not a hard story to sell when you're telling a story of I'm sorry. Um, and I, we're going to tell some stories today. Um, Sue, Sue and Evan is in the room. We're going to tell a little bit of, of her story. Um, and it really is about the stories. And at the end, we're going to tell some of our stories uh, in terms of interacting uh, with patients. And as I walk through the first year of this program, um, I also like to pick up slides for presentations because I kind of hate the fire drill of throwing something together at the end. And I had these thought bubbles in my head that for me to figure out how to implement this program, I really kind of have to lay out for myself first uh, and also for providers and, and patients and, and my team, how do you merge these, these, these thought bubbles? What's a complication? What's an adverse event? What's a medical error? And then what's the intersection of that? And I had the hardest time doing this. And, and part A of why it was so hard was I didn't know that there was a function within PowerPoint that allowed you to put these bubbles together and create a Venn diagram. <laughs> and the other part was that I, I realized as I educated myself on this over time uh, that I, I didn't fully understand the intersection of these three bubbles. Uh, and I realized that these three bubbles intersect differently for different people. And they intersect differ differently for physicians, I think, than they do for patients. And so I'm going to try and put those bubbles together uh, by the end of my talk. Um, and we're going to talk primarily around adverse events and medical errors. And I think to understand how those bubbles intersect, we've got to define an adverse event. I don't think I need to define that for anyone in this room. I think intuitively you understand that, or through training you've come to understand that. Medical error, the failure um, of a planned action to be completed as intended, or the, the use of a wrong plan to achieve an aim, I think is also understandable. Um, and I think if we start to, to intersect those, I think we can all get to this uh, fairly, fairly easily. And do I have an agreement in the room on that, that medical errors are a subset of adverse events? And so the question then really lies with, how does this work? Um, and how does this work in the mind of, of uh, clinicians? And how does this work uh, in the mind of patients? And when I started to put this together, and I, I put this together over many, many months by listening to um, uh, the forum that uh, Linda put on on behalf of MITS in the fall, uh, and through sitting through our own QI directors forums, wherein we reviewed a case related to a, um, a, a bowel, a, a gallbladder case where the, the bile duct was nicked uh, during surgery. And we went through the review of this. It was deemed to be non-preventable. And the surgeons, a number of them, the surgeon's response in the room, and I'm privileged as an ED physician to be sitting in now on these various case reviews and discussions that I was not privileged to attend in the past. I had my, my world of emergency medicine. And they shrugged their shoulders and they said, we nick bile ducts. It's about a one, two, three in a hundred chance. It's a, it's a complication. This isn't an adverse event. This just happens. Um, and I don't think that any patient goes into any procedure, irrespective of the relationship they have with the provider, uh, or the uh, quality, if you will, of the informed consent, I do not think any patient goes into that experience thinking that they're going to be part of that one or two or three percent. If they did, no one would have a procedure done. And Lynn's going to share a story uh, afterwards of a recent experience she had at a hospital with her child where, where she really thought that she could become part of that one percent and she needed to speak up and how difficult it is as a, even as a care provider to be able to do that. So why, why are we talking about this? Um, we're talking about this because adverse events on chart reviews, as, de as, um, as, as determined by IHI, exist in about 25 to 30 percent of medical records. We're talking about this because we know that we don't do a great job as a medical community of reporting adverse events uh, into, uh, 
uh, here, here we've got uh, incident reporting systems. We have a little program at Milton where I get my hand slapped or we have to put 25 cents in a jar if we call it the incident reporting system. It's now the event notification system. And I still haven't quite gone from the pejorative language to the positive language around this. But there, there's a misperception about what constitutes harm and what constitutes uh, an adverse event. And that, that disparity is the dynamic tension that exists between healthcare quality uh, and between, uh, between clinicians. And that's ultimately the gap that we need needed to bridge at Milton. We're also talking about this because it makes us better clinicians and it makes our organizations better. It helps us deliver patient-centered care. And we learn from these events and ultimately uh, do a better job of looking after each other. So what I'm going to do now, possibly with Melinda's help, and possibly I'll do it on my own. Yeah, I got it? I think I got it. We're going to, I'm sorry, we're, we're going we're gonna to tell us. I'd like to thank uh, Cryco uh, for this, and I'd like to thank Sue, who's in the room, for really leading this, this story and, and bringing it forward. The patient was a friend of mine. She's a nurse at the hospital. Uh, took care of both of my kids when they were born. And she came in with a parotid tumor. It was a much more difficult resection than I anticipated. When we got to the recovery room, her smile wasn't symmetric anymore, so my stomach fell down to the floor. This was a known complication. Now, this is something that we had talked about before. I went over the case in my head, you know, over and over and over again. You know, what could, what did I do? What, where did the problem happen? Did I do anything that was inappropriate or wrong? Or how could I have avoided this problem? Um, you know, that was part of it. And part of it was just feeling miserable because you know, I'd done something horrible to somebody I cared about. For me, I still have a lot of work ahead of me to get through it, and I can't imagine what a clinician feels. Because, you know, they, the plan was to make something better, and it made it worse. And that's not what they're into to doing. Everybody I know has had some kind of complication or adverse outcome with some patient along the way, not necessarily through your own fault, but you're responsible for them and, and things don't go well. That's really difficult. Most physicians don't talk about it. They just suffer. As physicians, we see severe human suffering without treating our own soul. Whatever uniform you put on, you're still a human being first, and you have a right to a good quality of life. Whether you're a hospital CEO, a thoracic surgeon, or you're working in janitorial services, you didn't surrender your rights to be a human being just because you work in this mission-driven hospital setting. Something has to be done. Something has to be done. How, how are they going to be caring for the next patient effectively if they're carrying this around with them? As a chief medical officer in a large academic setting, um, it is our job to provide safe, efficient, high quality care for all of our patients. And that care is ensured by a medical staff performing at the top of their game to the highest level of their abilities. And anything that interferes uh, with that level of performance is of major concern uh, to me and to the institution because it impairs to one degree or another the caliber of care that we're giving. The thing that I think would have helped me the most was getting some degree of empathy so that people would say, you know, this terrible thing has happened and we feel terrible for you. You know, it's, this is, I wish someone had said that, you know? And then, after that, finding someone 
or directing me in the right place where I could work out the feelings that I'm having as a result of that to get my life back in order. These, these, are, these are pretty powerful stories, and I would say for those of you who are interested in implementing a care program, you can't implement these programs without storytelling. Uh, and I was uh, prepared to get up in front of um, our medical staff and tell the story uh, that some of you have heard in this room about uh, my experience being sued. I was committed uh, as a clinician to improving systems. It's how I got into um, a tract of healthcare quality from emergency medicine. You have to tell the, fa the patient stories. Um, you have to uh, elevate the brave people within your organizations that are willing to get up there and do the right thing. Um, and I thank Sue tremendously for taking this story forward and allowing us to do uh, just that. What Sue spoke uh, eloquently about at the MITS Forum uh, in the fall uh, was uh, essentially her moment of truth and her experience. Uh, and I hope I, I, I had a mentor who once told me don't let the details get in the way of a good story, so I have a habit of kind of changing things around. And that's going to be a problem because Sue's in the room. Um, but uh, her, her, her experience uh, um, coming out of the recovery room after that surgery and going down what she still refers to today as the, the hallway, the hell hallway, um, was, um, was, is something that lives with her. Um, she's, she's used that to, uh, to tell stories to the rest of us so we can help understand the impact of, of this uh, on patients uh, and on caregivers. Uh, she's committed her, her life after this event, this life-changing event, uh, to helping improve the quality of life uh, for patients going forward, but also for all of our caregivers. Uh, and um, she, she became aware and learned uh, of uh, her, her event. Um, in the face of her, her grandchild uh, when they reacted to the paralysis uh, uh, on her face because she had not been told uh, by her caregiver what was going on despite deeply sensing that something was terribly wrong. Um, that was what she described as her moment of truth. These moments of truth can be uh, devastating events like this. They can be mundane uh, events uh, that occur during a hospital visit or an outpatient visit, uh, but nonetheless, uh, they define uh, the experience uh, that the patient has uh, with, with, uh, of the care that they've received, but they also really uh, define the patient's perception of the organization uh, and their caregivers. I think it was Maya Angelou who said that um, patients may not remember what you said or did, but they will certainly remember uh, how you made them feel. And that really is what, about, what this program is all about, and it's having staff that are committed from the C-suite to the front line uh, to doing the right thing and who are prepared to say I'm sorry uh, when it's appropriate to do so. I will say that on my journey for, through this, I, uh, I'm skipping a slide, yep, yeah. we're good. Um, so we're, <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna do something a little different here. Uh, in front of you uh, at the break, there was a piece of paper uh, put down uh, on the, the, ch the chair in front of you that's got a post-it note on it. Um, some of you may recognize this case from uh, some breakout sessions that we held last year. And what I'd like you to do is to read through that case and just on the post-it note that's in the bottom corner, write a single emotion that you think the wife who is sitting in the waiting room outside the OR um, may be feeling uh, when she uh, learns uh, what has um, become uh, of the, uh, the outcome of her husband's surgery. So read the case. Um, at the end of the case, you're going to write down a single emotion uh, on that piece of paper, and then we're going to have some discussion about um, patients' reactions to these adverse events when they occur. Take the post-it note, pass it to the end of the aisle. Uh, there'll be people on either side of the aisle, uh, and they are going to, while we watch the next video, and uh, I try to make you laugh during this talk. I, I also make people cry. I have one VP that will not come to our patient safety and quality forum without Kleenex. <laughs> um, and uh, we're going to write down the emotions on the... Uh, on the easels at the front of the room. And while we're doing that, I'm gonna play something that I've used in the storytelling at BID Milton uh, about um, why really we are in healthcare and why we do what we do and how can we take the patient's perspective. Many of you in this room have probably seen this video. Uh, it's from the Cleveland Clinic and I think they've done remarkable work. They also recently in February released a follow-up video to this which is worth looking up on YouTube. Oops, sorry.
You're transfixed by the video. Just pass those post-it notes to the end of the aisle as you get them written. So, um, I haven't seen the, the writing on the front of the, uh, the easels here, but we're going to have a little bit of a conversation around some of the emotions. Um, and I'm going to read uh, from, from the case. Uh, bear in mind, this will get a little foggy, and then like the fog lifting over San Francisco, the fog will lift as I, as I finish up this next couple of minutes. So I'm going to read from the case um, that says, uh, however, this is the second to last paragraph of the case, however, under the rushed circumstances, the site was not marked per the hospital's policy and protocol, and a timeout was not completed. This is where the left-hand side of the room is getting confused. Um, Dr. Jones entered the room, and the patient was already prepped and draped with only a small target surgical area visible. Anxious to relieve the hematoma, he moved quickly. Dr. Jones was shocked to find no evidence of blood and determined immediately that they had entered the right side and not the left side of the cranium. The hematoma was decompressed at 6.08 p.m. Following the surgery, the patient's pupils were bilaterally fixed and dilated, and he was maintained on life support. The patient's wife and five children are waiting in the surgical waiting area. So I'd ask you to think a little bit about what resources do you have at your hospital um, to support that family member in that moment, and who in your organization is going to make that personal connection uh, with that patient's family uh, to be able to support them through 
um, in some cases, a lifetime uh, of care uh, in your organization afterwards. The other side of the room uh, got this, this story. This is the, uh, the blue side of the room. So the easel to my left. Even under the rushed circumstances, the site was marked per the hospital's policy and protocol, and a timeout was completed. Anxious to relieve the hematoma, Dr. Jones moved quickly. Skin incision to the left side was at 5.32 p.m., 15 minutes later. Following uncomplicated removal of the bone flap, Dr. Jones decompressed the hematoma. However, despite heroic surgery, the patient's pupils were bilaterally fixed and dilated, and he was put on life support. So this is the moment where I get to come out from behind the microphone and take a look at these, these lists of emotions. So in the case where the timeout was performed, we've got fear, we've got terror, sadness, despair, shock, numb, and confused. What do we have over on the other, other side of the room? <coughs> Horror, anxiety, fear, frustration, shock, disbelief. Is there anything that corresponds to furious on that side? No. So it was interesting. When we did this uh, exercise um, at, at Milton, um, anger showed up on both sides of the room. And I was shocked. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. Um, and, and I expected it to show up on the side of the room where the timeout was, was, was uh, not performed, but I did not expect it on the other side. And so I, I asked uh, the... Um, about 80 or so people from the hospital. We have about 700 employees participated. And uh, I asked, what's with the anger? And uh, the case manager said she would be angry with her husband for having delayed the surgery and gone with the stereotactic option. Um, and, 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 and angry that this happened. Uh, and, 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 and angry in, in this state of shock and denial uh, that she's left in this position where she doesn't know what to do and she doesn't know how to move forward. Um, this, was, this was a clinician's perspective. Um, at the, the MITS forum uh, in, in the fall, uh, one of the presentations was, was from uh, Linda's, Linda's group, and it talked about the anger uh, and the sadness and the guilt, the shame, the grief, the loss, the spectrum of emotions that people feel after these adverse events. I would say that in most organizations, we are um, somewhat equipped to respond to those events that we know about during the day from Monday to Friday, from seven to four, when the ORs are running. Um, I would say that we are inadequately prepared as a healthcare system to address these events, evenings and weekends, uh, holidays. Um, we are inadequately prepared to address these events that don't make it into our event notification systems, where there is not a culture of um, reporting into the event notification systems. Um, and uh, it, it's, a, it's a real challenge. Um, I think the, the emotions that are up on the board, if you, if you look what differentiates the one emotion from all the others is that, that anger is a big piece of that. We're gonna talk a little bit about some of the, the anger moments that uh, Lynn and Alex and, and David and I have sat through in conversations with families. But I would point out to you that anger is the one empowering emotion. All of the other emotions that are on the easels in front of us and on the screen behind me are emotions that if one accesses, they leave you feeling very vulnerable um, at a time when you are at your most vulnerable. Um, and some people will uh, fold into the caring arms of the providers who provide that care and contact with them in that moment. And some people will not be able to do that. They will need anger as that defense mechanism. And if you're gonna, imp um, if you're gonna implement a care program, I will tell you that you have to be prepared uh, to face anger. Uh, and you will have to prepare your clinicians to face that anger at a time when what they're looking for is the first steps of healing, uh, which is um, that s some ability to get to closure and be forgiven. And forgiveness may come, it may never come. Um, it will certainly come over a timeline and it is unlikely uh, to occur uh, in the moment of that first disclosure conversation or even in my experience, uh, the follow-up conversations uh, afterwards. I'm, I'm gonna ask, um, at this point, I'm gonna ask Rick Boothman, uh, who's in the, in the audience. This case came uh, from uh, the University of Michigan. I'm gonna ask him to comment uh, both on the case um, from, from two perspectives. I think he has some, some comments that he would like to make in general about care programs and where he thinks they will go. Um, but in this particular case, this was a case that did occur at the University of Michigan. Um, the neurosurgeon is well known uh, to Rick, uh, and that neurosurgeon has endured his own trauma from this. Um, so I'm going to ask Rick to um, illuminate a little bit um, the journey that he went through with that caregiver and where that caregiver is today 
uh, based on uh, his experience in this adverse event. Thanks, Ashley. Um, when this happened, I was having dinner with my wife at about 10.30 at night, and I got this urgent phone call, and many of us went immediately to the hospital. The caregiver, the surgeon involved, was completely stunned, and the wife sitting in the waiting room with her children still unaware. Um, we were there at the sharp point of the disclosure. Um, we managed that, I think, exceedingly well, but the wife heard very little of what we were saying. She was completely bewildered and, and shocked. Um, we spent the, almost the whole evening, literally until about three or four in the morning with the surgeon, um, who is known in our system for not only his caring, but his attention to detail. He is a vascular neurosurgeon and, and he really is compulsive in his work and this was an especially hard pill for him to swallow even though in truth what he did was something that many neurosurgeons would not have even attempted. Most with fixed and dilated pupils would have declared the patient dead. That didn't carry any weight and today um, he's, he accepted our help. We took him out of service right away and got him some help, but not long term. He, ref he will tough it out today and tell you that he's fine. He is one of our greatest proponents, but he focuses on this over and over, and this scar will stay with him probably his whole career. So we talk a lot, he talks a lot to the residents he trains about events like this, almost to the exclusion of other things, and I'm seeing some easing of that balance, but um, it's hard and it, and it rips you up just to watch him even today, even though he does a lot of good uh, now three years later, I think, or, uh, or thereabouts. Did you want to make any other I, comments about the program? As I was listening today, I just asked Dr. Sands and Dr. Woodward to, if I could just take a minute, and I say this without any hubris, really. Um, we've been doing this 13 years, and I think I can say with confidence I've seen your future. Um, I know what this is going, how this is going to pan out, and it's all good. So I made a list of some of the things that are going to, that you're going to experience because as as they were describing some of the challenges and some of the things you're experiencing now, I, it was a throwback. I, I was taken back to uh, my days, my earlier days. Although you're moving at a much faster pace, and it's really gratifying for me to see. But just a couple of things I want to. I want to give you a glimpse of, your language is going to change. Literally, your language will change. You will stop talking about things, about whether or not care was defensible, which connotes can I find an expert to support this, versus whether or not this care is what we expect of ourselves. That's really a neat change to see how, how deeply it gets. Um, the language, some language that you have will disappear, like <clears throat> should we talk to the patient? or should we offer compensation? Those things will become second nature to you. In fact, what will disappear is the focus right now on MedMal. It becomes background noise, and, it, and it, it's important background noise, but it's not the main goal. And you'll identify the main goal with much greater clarity. You're going to see other things disappear. What passes for peer review at your organization will probably disappear and be exchanged for something evidence-based and much more robust with no excuses. Um, your illusions will disappear. Your vision of yourself is going to fade to something not so good at first. You're going to hear descriptions of yourself as you talk to patients that you don't recognize. And after the pattern gets established, you'll be determined to change those things, how patients were treated, how patients were treated in the informed consent process before any problem happened. And you'll gradually get to the point where the ultimate goal reveals itself to be much clearer than it is today. The ultimate goal isn't reduction of your malpractice dollars. Your ultimate goal isn't to improve some of these numbers. Your ultimate goal really is to gain the optimal patient experience and the optimal patient care. And that's what we're all in this about, whether you're an old fat lawyer like me or, or or you're a, a custodian in the hospital, or you're a surgeon, or you're a risk manager. That's really what we're about, and that becomes really clear so that our efforts now are being focused entirely, almost. I mean, we think we've got this part down. Our efforts are entirely focused now on improving the patient experience, on taking the things that we're learning and saying, 
this has got to be better. We've got we've to form that trust and that sacred relationship with the patient is really what's really mostly important. And that's what we learned. This is a speed bump right now that you have to go over. But the most important things are the, more, the deeper things. So don't be afraid. Um, those fear mongers uh, have reasons for it. Sometimes they're not great reasons. There's a big industry uh, invested in the status quo. And they're going to tell you over and over again that this won't work here. This works in Sweden. This works in Britain. This works in Canada. This works in Tokyo. I've been involved with all those places. It works because it affects people at their more, most organic human nature. But it'll work, and it'll make all of you better at what you do. So don't be afraid. Um, I think I've seen that future, and you're going to find that we really are all in this together. But thanks for that opportunity. Thanks very much, Rick. So the, the adverse events have multifaceted consequences, and at this point, I think we, we, we know them from our experiences. Some of them are written on the screen. We hear them uh, in the stories that we've told. Um, I think one of my moments of truth in this process is that there is no process within our processes to care for providers over time. Uh, and even uh, in the implementation of the program at BID Milton, that largely lies uh, in the memory and the commitment of me and uh, the, risk, the risk management, the healthcare quality team, and nursing leadership to remind each other to keep reaching out, to put calendar reminders on our calendars, to keep spreadsheets and have organized systems to ensure that we have the follow-up. The follow-up has been very rewarding. Um, it is uh, what keeps me doing what I do, uh, and we will talk about some of those cases, and you'll have some chance, uh, chance to ask some questions in about another five minutes as I wind down this part of the talk. Um, we have to also understand that there are two different perspectives here to get back to those bubbles that I showed you earlier. And in putting oneself in the patient's shoes, as the Cleveland Clinic video so, so aptly does, um, what we find is that there's a fundamental difference between what patients feel, think, observe, experience, and the clinician's perspective. Um, and this is uh, work that goes back to uh, Tom Gallagher's work, who's currently at the uh, University of Washington. Um, that clinicians believe that deviations from prescribed standards of care only are the types of errors and things that need to be disclosed. So in that Department of Surgery meeting where the bile duct was nicked, that was a complication. Um, there was a complete lack of understanding about why we were even discussing this from a healthcare quality uh, perspective. <coughs> Um, we're going to talk about a bile duct that was nicked, and we're going to talk about a conversation with the family, and we're going to talk about how we brought together um, a surgeon, a surgical PA, a gastroenterologist, and a number of people to get that patient's perspective that we were able to bring because of having one of these family meetings and fundamentally changed. And I knew I had a win when a 78-year-old surgeon asked me to email him the link for the Cleveland Clinic video, uh, which we also played in that, uh, in that beer protected uh, discussion. Patients see this very differently. Um, yes, they do believe that if you deviate from the standard of care, um, that this is a, a, an error and that it needs to be disclosed. Um, I think patients believe more what I believe in terms of what's important in this program. And it's not about, we, we've talked in the algorithms about was the standard of care met? That is a very legalistic definition. And I think if I took that to my PFAC and said, what do you think about this? If I talk to a patient about that, they would say, it sounds regulatory, it sounds legal, and it sounds cold, and it sounds like you don't care. Uh, the dialogue that we've started to have is, was the care reasonable? And it's exactly what Rick just said was, is this the, the, the standard of care that you expect of yourselves, and it's the standard that you hold yourself to? Uh, and when you start having a conversation around that, um, you end up doing, I think, the right thing. Um, patients also believe certain um, so, sorry, um, a poor quality of service and, and poor interpersonal skills, so communication, not surprisingly. Um, they lump that into the bucket uh, of error, and um, they carry that forward with them. Uh, and these are, um, these are, in my mind, absolutely uh, contributors to uh, events that turn around and resurface in many cases years, years later um, as, we, uh, as we, uh, we care for these patients over time or as we're notified through pre-litigation notices now about these cases. So I would say from a uh, clinician perspective, and, and Rick can maybe correct me if I'm wrong here, because he and I have not discussed this. This is where I, I put the, the bubbles for, for, for the surgical cases we've talked about, perhaps some clinicians. They, they get the concept of an adverse event, as long as it wasn't them that caused the adverse event. 
if it was them, I think they can, they can carry that very personally uh, for the rest of their life. And they, they, they believe that that error was something that was under their control. Uh, it's something that they own. They are harmed by it, and they are forever changed by it. And some of them will never let themselves off the hook for that. And therefore, that medical error bubble for them never quite falls within the adverse event bubble. And I think on the other side of the spectrum for some clinicians, they don't view complications as adverse events. They view complications as, what do you expect? The risk was one to three and 100. And when it happens, um, it's a way perhaps as, as a physician that we emotionally let ourselves off the hook uh, for something bad happening to patients. I think we have to understand when we're, we're implementing a program like this, with any program you have to sort of set your sights on where you wanna be, you have to assess where you are, and what you do in that is you create a gap analysis. And I would suggest that the gap analysis that we've got is the difference between the clinician's perspective and the patient's perspective, where really all of these things fall into uh, one continuum. And unless you're prepared as a medical staff, as a nursing staff, uh, and as an administrative staff to look at it from that perspective, um, you will not be successful implementing this program. And I would say to you that the way to implement the program is to tell the stories um, and to involve the clinicians in the stories to involve patients uh, through your patient family advisory council in the decision making and in the, the review uh, as appropriate. It takes a long time to develop that culture within our organization. But again, identify where you wanna be and don't be afraid to take the step forward. Um, so now what? Um, what we learned, as I alluded to at the beginning of uh, my talk, was that about 90% of the time the care process is really just about communication um, and helping people work through, clinicians and, and patients and family members work through uh, these different perspectives. Um, I think patients are open uh, to hearing the full side of the story. I think they, they, are, they are fearful and they, they are distrustful because we cloak a lot of this information in secrecy or don't provide it. Um, and I think that negotiating these two different uh, healthcare and patient perspectives um, that really shouldn't be different, but I think they really are quite different, um, is where the, the rubber meets the road. It's also where the mess occurs. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the, some of the mess of that uh, now. I like to, to snap pictures of, um, of, of things that I find amusing when I'm traveling. So I was in London at uh, Christmas time uh, at the Piccadilly Circus uh, and tube stop, and th there was this, this piece about Christmas in general, and Christmas covered, it's refusing to come unstuck even when the sticky tape does. And I just thought that's really a lot about what the care program is. Um, you've, got to, you've got to commit to this, uh, and your sticky tape is gonna get unstuck sometimes, and you've gotta have the right people around you to, to hold it all back together. So with that, I'm gonna uh, ask you to take a few minutes uh, for a, um, a, a quick, are we gonna take a break or should I continue? Continue, yeah. So well, what I'm gonna do now is invite uh, our panel up. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna first introduce Linda Kenny. Uh, Linda is uh, really a leader uh, in this. She is a, uh, the Executive Director of Medically Induced Trauma Support Services, MITS. MITS is one of the core members of MACRAMI. Uh, we are so pleased to have that patient perspective represented uh, in this consortium. Um, and we, uh, as, 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 as MACRAMI, support their mission uh, to support healing and restore hope to patients, families, and clinicians who've been affected by adverse medical events. So Linda, if you wanna come up and, and have a seat, and I'll also let, introduce Lynn Cronin, uh, Chief Nursing Officer and Vice President of Nursing at BID Milton, uh, Alex Campbell, our Director of Healthcare Quality and Patient Safety, also at BID Milton, and uh, David Polinick, uh, Risk Manager uh, for BID Milton. And I'll, uh, I'll perhaps start by um, asking, uh, because I think this is where, why we're all here and where we should start every one of these conversations, I perhaps ask Linda maybe to comment a little bit um, from the patient's perspective uh, on Jerome, Jerome's case. And I, I saw you had a, a visceral reaction to the, 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 the comments uh, and the emotions that the patient might be feeling, particularly around anger. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe if you could walk us through a little bit about your experience from hearing from sometimes very angry patients, very hurt, hurt and harmed patients, and patients who have not been able to access uh, a care program. Yeah, well, um, you know, I know my husband went right to anger, you know, and we often joke that Rick was gonna be in the ICO, ICU with me if um, the orthopedic surgeon wasn't there. But in this case, I think women, especially mothers, this is, I might be, well, I'm gonna say it anyway, what the hell, I get in trouble all the time. I think, um, I think, right away it's the shock but then we're thinking of our five kids oh my god what am i going to do we're, we're already into what are we going to do but the anger does come 
I think we just delay it. I, I think, so, you know, um, I'm thinking most of the Irish Catholic men I know would go right to anger because they didn't know how to process a feeling. But, um, so, <laughs> <laughs> but um, Linda, I'm married to an Irish man. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's been my experience. But anyway, um, <laughs> give them a little alcohol, though. And it's a whole different story. <laughs> um, no, but, but I'm thinking, and also, uh, one of the things I thought about is, you know, ironically, um, you know, we're going to be angry whether you did the wrong side or not, uh, most patients and families, because um, we're angry because our whole life has been turned upside down, you know, and, and we have to, as healthcare providers and people working in this process, we just have to be ready to deal with that and have the right people in the positions to be able to walk through that. We had a patient recently who came to us, and she's angry. She wasn't told specifically about an outcome that now has impacted her for the rest of her life that she'll have to deal with. And it was one of those complications, but it wasn't a very good, um, uh, you know, probably, uh, she, they probably didn't do a good job at the beginning explaining what the complications are. So it came as a complete shock. And that, she came in to see um, our psychologist and at one point the psychologist said are you suicidal or homicidal that's how angry this patient was um you know we we've since heard from her she's had a nice calm meeting with the hospital and everything but you know what she said she said it was a safe place for her to come and be angry and somehow she sensed that we wouldn't judge and she could let it out there because she wasn't letting it out anywhere else in her life she was just stuffing it so um, I, I see this all the time, but you know, is Rick still here? Did he leave? Yes. Rick, do you remember last week we were at the MPSF Congress and we went to a session on storytelling. And um, I, I'm sure some of you have heard these names, but Helen Haskell and Tanya Lord from New Hampshire, they both talked about the losses of their children, right? I never cry in public, but honest to God, that day I, I had a lump in my throat and, and the, the pain, because they asked the question, could this still happen today? And from the calls that we get at MITS, yes, it can. People are still not listening appropriately to patients and families. But what got me is the question that you asked Rick. Rick said, from his experience, he often hears from patients and family members about feeling guilt. Um, and uh, do you feel guilty? And, and Tanya was able to say, I've worked through it. I, I feel, you know, I've been able to forgive myself. I was a young mother with no tools. If it was the Tanya today, they would have listened to me, you know? So she's, she's done it. And Helen said, which broke my heart, I will never forgive myself. So that's the other thing that the surviving people go through is uh, the shoulda, coulda, what if. For some reason, they believe um, that they had some control over it. And, I, and I'll tell you, even in my case, my husband thinks that that uh, it was because he left the hospital that day, which is ludicrous. But in his mind, he will never leave the hospital again while I'm having surgery. It doesn't make sense, but it is what it is. So I, I just want you to think about that. It's, And I think maybe we have to do a better job. And, and, and Winnie and I have been realizing that, that maybe that's another role that MITS can play, is doing a better job helping to educate the um, healthcare community around what we've learned um, from the tra trajectory of feelings. And when I think that goes right into my, my story. So we're going to tell you some stories that we've experienced. Um, and I think um, maybe I'll talk about the my first story and then um, I will explain some of the answers. So I'm sitting in my office. Um, this is a few years ago and I get a phone call, a random phone call in my office. I don't know what I, I'm, I'm, I want to do. I think I want to sue my doctor. So I was like, okay, so I listened to the story, um, immediately notified risk manager at the time, we did have a different risk manager. Um, we decided to bring the lady in and meet with her. And um, she was one of these cases that was a Nick Bow that had gone through medical review and had gone through all the normal process that we do in the hospital. Um, she came in and she'd had the surgery two years ago. So she came in and I have to tell you, I will never ever forget that lady as long as I live. She'd lived, I think, clinically depressed. She'd had to, uh, an extended kind of rehab, wound issues, all things that had led, that had affected her job. But mainly, she um, showed up at the care meeting herself, her husband, and her sister. 
And from the dynamics, you could see the husband and the sister, I think, were thinking, this lady's, she's crazy, and we're living with this. And all she wanted to hear from the surgeon, now she'd gone to the surgeon six weeks post-op, normal, and he was very engaging, very happy, but never said really anything about the complication. Ignored it. Um, and all she wanted was to hear the word, I am sorry. That's all she wanted to hear. And the agony that that woman went through for, for two years, I, I can't explain how much that affected me personally. The thought of two words, I am sorry, or maybe three words, I am sorry, affected this woman for all this time. So from that, we arranged meetings with the surgeon and we referred her to MITS because I knew that resource was available to her and I had contact and she was able to move on just after that meeting. So I, as much as that affected me, um, it affected me for a long time afterwards because I just felt so emotionally drained um, from that meeting. Um, so that was one experience. And then my second experience that I'll never forget, um, you know, when these things happen, one of the best things I, I think any of us can do is make a connection with the family member there and then because it's a familiar face. It's somebody that they know. So we'd had an event and um, the family came back and I'd got to know the daughter really well. I sat with her for five, six hours, kind of, you know, giving a coffee, phone, doing other things you do. And she came back with her, um, her, fa her father. Um, it was a mother who'd had surgery, her father, her son and herself. And she, you know, during the team, we all take roles. We, we have pre-meetings before we go into the team. We all know what our role is when we go into the team meeting. And um, usually Ashley is, you know, describes the medical reasons and we all have our own little role. But this woman had been in and out of our institution to be transferred to the medical center and then gone to rehab and gone to another hospital. The daughter had a list during that encounter, the, the the family, the patient, had seen 78 providers. Over the course of six weeks. Over the course of six weeks. That, and she had every, because I was sitting right next to her, she had hold of my hand, and she was reading 78 providers, which was like, so she did all the talking in the meeting, and I have to say, this was a, a positive meeting. They, you know, it, it was good. She wanted to know the explanation. The grandson asked some questions. The husband never said a word. And we're all thinking, this is going gut. Uh, two minutes before the end of the meeting. And we were probably about an hour and a half. <laughs> these, are, these are not quick meetings. We're probably about an hour and a half into this conversation. And this was a moment of truth and a lesson learned, what, Linda, what yeah. Lynn's going to describe. The, the husband said, I am angry. And we all look. And he was angry because the surgeon took time to make a telephone conversation to get consent from the husband, and in his mind, that delayed his wife's surgery. So this, this patient had a, had a complication that required a transfer from an outpatient area to yeah. the OR. Um, and so there was a, an initial call to reach the family and let them know that something had happened. And then as we mobilized the, the care team to address the acute patient need, which is always your first priority in these events, um, we, we got that underway. We then, uh, the, the surgeon became involved and then reached out uh, to the husband to get consent. Um, and he, yeah. and so what was, that, what was our lesson learned in that one? Because there's been a lesson learned in every the single one. The quietest lesson. person in the room is the one that you need to focus in on. That. Yeah. I think that was a lesson I learned yeah. that day. Absolutely. Because, you know, he never said a word. And, and, and I'm thinking from this day, he's still thinking about that. But I think it does you, it makes me very humble when I go into those meetings because it reminds me every day that I would chose to be a nurse because I want to make a difference in patients' lives. And I think just recently, as Ashley had talked about, uh, my son has been sick and he you know, needs a major surgery. And we were in and out of a local, he had SVT and we were in and out of a local hospital and, and nine times within the last six weeks. Great experience, everybody was wonderful, except I had an experience where they were about to give him IV adenosine and nobody had asked his name, nobody looked at the drug, and I'm standing there and I thought to myself, I can't have this conversation when he's dead. So I said, stop, and everybody looked at me. 
And I tell you, for me, who is a chief nursing officer who deals with this all the time, it was she's, such... She's a little bit of a wallflower, a bit shy yeah, and retiring. But it was such a difficult conversation to front of a whole room of practice because, of course, it caused an excitement. There was a lot of people in the room. But to stop, and everybody looked at me and they said, nobody has checked the drug or asked his name. And I, I just... And then, the, you know, but it just made me realise how difficult it, it is to... And I know what should happen, and it was really difficult. And I think the other story is, you know, my son's facing major surgery, and I don't want to be the 1% complication. Because really, you're the 100%, as Linda was just showing me, you're the 100% complication. So. Alex is, is going to tell you a little bit about why it was so easy for me to say yes to Ken on the parking lot. Um, because the culture, the, I don't think Ken knew I was in the parking lot at the time, but I remember this moment as, as clear as day. Um, the, um, the, the organization, I think, was ready, um, and it, ha it was ready because of a commitment uh, in the C-suite to the concept of this, but it was also ready uh, because of the, 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 um, the culture that existed within healthcare quality. Um, and Alex and, and Lynn were involved two years prior to us starting our care program, which, which launched really in, in uh, December of uh, 2012, uh, and, and had, a, had a, a disclosure and a conversation. And I want to tell a little bit about that story. So let me take you back to about 2011. I was the director of quality at that time, and this event occurred, and the first thing we did at those days was, is this an SRE? Do we need to meet the, re meet the regulatory requirements? Do we need to complete the seven-day follow-up, the root cause analysis, communicate to the patient, and we are done. We were meeting the regulatory requirement. We were, we were doing what we needed to do. And for whatever reason at that time, we ban began to realize we need to do more than this. We are uh, providing a disservice to the patient or the victims of the event that had occurred. And Dr. Woodward started today saying that care is not rocket science, but clearly is a science and perhaps even an art form. Because what we've realized since that time, and before I even get into the story, is that no event is ever the same. You know, I'm a cardiac nurse by my, my background, and I used to always hear AFib being described as a regularly irregular. And that's how I look at each one of these events. You don't know what you're going to face when you go in, despite the best plans that you think you're going. And the other thing is, is that the uniqueness of the event, the uniqueness of the individuals you're going to be dealing with, and so therefore what happens is there's no single individual is equipped to be able to manage this. And so what we've identified is clearly each of us have specific gifts that are unique to us. And at certain times during this process and during these disclosures and during these follow-up, it's not unusual that one of us may take the lead more than the other, depending on the, our experiences, our situations, our connectedness with the patient, etc. So that, that, that really is a, a key thing to be mindful of, that um, it, it takes a team to really get through this process, including the patient and the family members, if necessary. So since I had started the story, going back to 2011, let me do that since I've taken two minutes to get there. <laughs> so in 2011, we had an event, and which isn't uncommon. We had an elderly gentleman admitted to our organization with chronic cardiac and pulmonary disease. Um, he, he was like a, a cat with nine lives. This gentleman was elderly and should have died 20 years before, but he kept coming back to us. And, and uh, you know, something? I think he was probably on his 15th life and I had no reason to doubt he was going to have 20 lives. <laughs> However, during this occasion, he was admitted to the hospital, and he, he, he was fading. He was 93. He was fading, but nevertheless, uh, we had no reason to doubt that he wasn't going to make it out this time. Why would we? He had dodged a bullet so many times before. We, we knew his wife. She, we, 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 it was somebody who, because unfortunately, because of the frequent readmission of this gentleman, we got to know him. However, during the night one night, um, he fell. And as a result of his fall, he fractured his hip, and he fractured his shoulder as well. And I was decided, what do we need to do for this gentleman? And after much of the evaluation, it was identified, although he required surgery, he wasn't a surgical candidate and certainly wouldn't be able to survive the surgery should that be the case. And here we are, four years later. I still remember the words. And I'll get to this in a second. I do apologize. But this is the power of what the words said. So it was decided at this time that the gentleman was going to be put into a hospice care and we were going to take care of him. And he died about three days later. We did our root cause analysis. We did what we needed to do. And then Lynn and I decided, let's meet with the wife and her son. We invited them in. We had never done this before. We went into this event thinking, we've been nurses for over 30 years. We know what to do. We're compassionate. We're empathetic patient people. We are concerned for this poor woman. 
who's been married to this man for over 60 years. We go into the room, we prepare it. She, she accepted our invitation. She wanted to hear what had happened or what didn't happen. And so she came into the room and with her son and it was cordial. One of the things we had managed to do at that time, long before the leading practices of care, was is that I was able at the time of the event to connect with her, as did Lynn, and we maintained the communication with her until such times as we were able to meet with her in person and her son to share. It was quite clear we were going to have, everything was on the table. We weren't going to hide anything. We were going to show what we could have done better, and there were opportunities for improvement, certainly there was. And we had done many things since that time to try and ensure patients are safer. We met the wife, we explained the events, and she had said to me, what did she say? Because I am, I am, I'm going to be affected. Yeah. Uh, well, I think, I I th I'll try and hold it together. Yeah, let me, let, let me give it a go. This is what I like. The, the, the thing that I was building up to, the, the one phrase that resonates with me to this day, she says, I had such little time with my husband, and you took that away from me. So at that time, I think you and I, uh, yeah, so immediately I had the effect that you saw today, mm -hmm. and it surprises me, and we talk about trauma to the provider, and even though I wasn't directly involved, here we are, several years later, you see the effect it still has on me, because I saw the effect that it had on this poor woman. She said, I don't get to sit at the end of the couch and watch the Monday night football game with him anymore. And even though it was unlikely she was ever going to be able to have that for much longer anyway, even though he may have had 25 lives to come, we took that away from her. Or she perceived we took that away from her. And the fact is, is that she, she says, maybe I only had two or three days to hold his hand at the bedside. I didn't even have that. And so therefore, as Ashley had said before, anger is such a powerful emotion. That's all she had. She, was, she wasn't in a situation where she could control the environment. The only emotion that she felt that she had any control over was her own rage, her own, own anger. And I had felt at that time that her, her, her demonstration was... I'm hurting, I want you to hurt too. Now whether she did or not, I'm not sure, but mm -hmm. it felt like someone needs to share the pain that I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. And we spoke, that, that was an epic meeting. That went on for, for two and a half to three hours. And we got to know all about this family. And what was rewarding at the end, <laughs> what, was, what was rewarding at the end is, is that there was a, as everyone was saying their goodbyes, we came together. There was hugs, there was kisses, there was all of those things, and it was a really an emotional journey. And we thought, this story is way too powerful to keep within this room. And really that was the impetus for setting up our patient safety forum in the organization, where we invite on a monthly basis all, all levels of staff. We tell the managers, come to this meeting and you must bring at least one other staff person with you, or Alec will be at the door and beat the living daylights out of you. Get a staff <laughs> person because they need to hear the story. And this is how this is uh, this is housekeeping and dietary. And this is all all all, set, all accounting people, the, the whole crew, and and that's where we do our storytelling. This is where we say, this is what we didn't do so well. This is the impact we had on people, and. I, were unaware of that, I didn't realize just the powerful impact. And people come to this meeting, we don't even need to invite people to come to me, they want to hear, they want to hear the stories, they want to hear the impact it had. And through that, through the, those demonstrations, people, it's almost like a catharsis for other people. I've been there, I've had similar types of experiences. And from that, we're able to identify takeaways from that so that we can hopefully at least ensure that we can mitigate events like this in the future. So this process is around resolution. I don't know if, Lynn, if you want to describe what her final request was in this, in this oh, yeah. process. So, that's what I was just going to say. I think Alex forgot about. So I, I, I feel comfortable sharing the name because she asked us oh, to. Yeah. Um, so her one request was that we name the full policy after her husband. She wanted some way to memorialize her husband. And um, I mean, Alex will never forget the name. Um, and I feel like right now I need to say it because to recognize him, um, it was a Mr. Hida. And um, I think it was just such a powerful request. And I think we did this before any of this started. And, um, it was really no. I'm not in tears because he was. So in I'm, I'm going to move us along. I'm going to move us along because I just want I want to share one one more story with you, then open it up for some questions. And, and you know, and I'm up here thinking, oh my God, these guys need support. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We've got each other. Um, so 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 David's going to share share a story uh, uh, with. Um, we had a, a a recent event in which a patient died. Um, and we, did, we have seen, uh, again, every event different, every conversation different, and things coming out of the left field. We think we, we were going in prepared, 
Um, and David's gonna tell you a little bit about the preparation work for the clinician in this and a little bit about how we were blindsided in the middle of this, um, this uh, I, I don't wanna call it a disclosure conversation because it, it, it was a communication uh, and support. We, we try to promote the um, active involvement of the staff early in the process to notify us of an event. Um, and usually we're pretty successful in that. My goal is to try to, to work with the patient and the, their family and the provider as soon as possible after the event occurs. Um, the way that we have the system set up is that you know one of us will get a phone call. I'm sure that's the same in every institution. I'll go down to the site of where the incident occurred. Um, I'll have a, a brief conversation with the physician to try to help that physician um, put things in perspective really quickly as to, as to where we are. I'll then go and meet with the family, um, and I'll stay with that family until their support comes in. Um, sometimes that may be through the operative procedure. Um, and during that time, I'm, I'm trying to gener generate a conversation with the, with the patient or, or the family member, trying to give them a person that they can identify with um, for the, throughout, the, throughout their stay for one, but afterwards, you know, that phone call that I try to make with them, um, and connect not only with them, but with their family. And, and in the end, what, what that does for us is it gives us um, mile markers along the way as to how the patient is doing, how the family is doing. Has their, have their emotions changed? Have they um, adapted to the situation a little bit differently than, than what we had anticipated? That becomes a really helpful tool in the end. Um, during the process, you know, the physician may be in my office six or seven times just venting because you know, that, that physician has experienced something that they're not typically used to experiencing either. You know, they're, they're angry when they first start out, I can't believe I did this. You know, they're upset, they don't know where it's gonna go. They wanna have someone that you know, knows what's going on and, and has the opportunity to vent, with that, with, vent freely. Um, and, and working that physician through the process as to what they might expect next. And then, you know, in the pre-disclosure or pre-communication meeting, you know, how to, how to help that physician reach the patient at a, at a level that the patient will understand. You know, when we had a, a physician who, who had a complication and we asked her to um, describe to us the event as she would describe it to the patient. And, and clearly her, her answer could have been, you know, the textbook answer that she was giving to the, to the board for her certification. Um, it wasn't the right level to reach the patient with. You, you know, you, you really want to think about a sixth grade level type of, of thing. You really want to get the, the to, um, to introduce some humility, some humbleness in, into, the, into, the, into the situation. And, and to walk the physician through that is really, um, it's a challenge, you know. One of the, the tools that I use to help break that challenge is I'll bring out a diagram of the anatomy, a very simple diagram, and I'll have the physician you know, walk me through that process, what happened in this particular case. And we'll use that same diagram with the family at, at the time of, of open communication. In this particular case that, that Dr. Yates was talking about, we went, all, we went through that whole process. Um, I had been in, in uh, heavily conver many conversations with the physician. I had several conversations with the patient. When we invited the patient back in. I, I, sh I should point out that this is actually the patient's wife. In this case, the, the patient died. Yeah. Um, so, when we brought the family back in, um, you know, they, they knew who I was, they knew who some of the other players were, um, and that was really important in helping us to uh, plan the meeting, you know, who's gonna say what, where are people gonna sit, some things just to think about, you know, in, in, the, in the preparation of that. The family member came in, and um, she was very, very angry. She was very angry that her husband had died. Um, her husband had been very ill in the past, and. You know, whether this, whether this procedure was, was too much of the time or not, it, you know, is, is part of the medical review process. During the, the conversations, Ashley will typically take the lead in helping the, the um, patient understand, you know, what the review process entailed, what some of the results of that process inc included. Um, he will support the physician in bringing the physician, you know, back to earth should the physician drift off in, in that conversation. Um, and the other part of this, and, and I think I'm gonna let my colleagues tell the other part of the story, but I walked the, the, the family member out. And walking the family member out of the, out of the hospital was a much different experience than when we saw her at that table. Um, so this is, the, this is the, the, uh, the event and then the debrief afterwards, which we always do. And David walked her to the door and, and he said it was like she thought 
when, when seriously, that, that was the word that was used. Um, and I'll tell you what happened in, in the event. So we're sitting there and the, she, the, she is very angry with the provider. She's not made eye contact with the provider for the entire time. The provider did a, a phenomenal job in walking through, being honest, being humble, being empathetic, apologizing, saying, I'm sorry. Uh, we all had our, had our roles. David clearly had a, a connection with her. She clearly turned to me as the executive leader that represented the institution uh, and, and to a, a lesser extent to Lynn because this was not a nursing uh, issue um, primarily. Um, and I didn't get the sense that this conversation was going very well. Um, it, was, it was cold, it was difficult. Um, and uh, and, and the, uh, she wasn't making the connection with the provider that I was hoping for. And uh, she was sitting roughly here, I was sitting here, and this, this gift bag came flying up from under the table, almost hit me in the face. I went a little bit like this. And I remember thinking, and then everything went into slow motion. Mm -hmm. I saw Alex's eyebrows go up. I saw Lynn look like this. I'm pretty sure I heard what my nephew would put on the cell phone as WTF out of my left <laughs> ear. And this, this thing went clunk on the table. And, and the first thing that hit my mind was, I was completely confused. Why is this lady giving us a gift? That's exactly, and, and that's, that's exactly what I thought. It was a completely disorienting. And, um, and, and I, I have a I, I reflect, we reflected on this afterwards, and, and what she had, had in a gift bag uh, that she had just picked up from the crematorium uh, was the urn of her husband's oh. ashes. And um, I, I regret to this day not inviting her to lift the urn out of that bag so we could hold that and, and, and honor him. Um, but it was, uh, it, it was yet another example of how these conversations <laughs> never go the way that I, you went. And I think to that too, what upset me about that whole thing, as much as we all were very confused, was we took the thunder, she wanted to shock us, and we took the thunder out of it because we already knew he'd, he'd gone to another institution, and he, we already knew he died. And when she knew that we knew she died, she was angry that we knew that. And how did we know that? And, and I, I, if going back, mm -hmm. I, I, I wish I could have given her the satisfaction of the shock and awe on our faces that we yeah. didn't know. I mean, that was the piece yeah. that I felt so yeah. sorry for her I and mean, but we knew what kind of a person i i was not totally unexpected so making the connection when it happens gives you uh, an insight into the patient's uh, what psyche kind of a person yeah. it is, so. so i want to open this up to, to to conversation and questions so feel free to come and ask us a little bit about the sharp end of the sick um, i think we've got a lot of experience between us now uh, in this um, the, uh, I will say that I've had feedback. I, I came out of that meeting thinking there is no doubt in my mind that we are doing the right thing. If that, if that family member had not had that opportunity with us as an organization, uh, with, with me representing that organization as an executive and with nursing and healthcare quality and that physician there, there's no doubt in my mind that this would have resurfaced uh, down the road uh, as a lawsuit. Uh, we were able to reach out through our patient safety organization to our uh, one of our outpatient partners in this project to make sure that um, this case also went through the outpatient case review process. Uh, and some of the feedback that I have informally had is that this patient did feel held and comforted through this, uh, as did the provider. Um, and uh, it, 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 it in many ways reinforces my commitment to this being uh, the right thing to do where we where we uh, where we started which was with uh, with I'm sorry this is the part that I've been looking forward to all morning so I get to say I'm sorry for being the only thing that stands between you and lunch because yeah. I've never been I've never been the pre-lunch speaker before and I always thought it was such a strange thing to say and now I get to confess that that is a disingenuous apology and that's those are not the kind of apologies you want because you are the only thing that is standing between me and a flight to San Francisco this afternoon. <laughs> So with that said, it's not till seven o'clock tonight, so I've got plenty of time. And I'd like to <laughs> invite people up to, to ask, uh, ask questions. I would like to conclude that story. When I walked the, the patient's wife out the door, she absolutely melted. Um, she had the opportunity to vent, and had she not done that, this would have festered. It would have you know, just added, aided her until it was unbearable. Um, and when I walked her out the door, you know, she, she was in full tears. She had the opportunity to, for the release um, and I, and I think we probably turn the corner with her. Um, you know, we'll never get her husband back, um, but it put her in a different place. Just, just in my story, I, we decided we were we were we were we had no guidelines, we had no best practice in 2011, and we were just I don't like to use the word winging it, but about six months after we had had our conversation, I did reach out to Mrs. Hida, and um, how are you doing? How are things going? And then I did so at 12 months. And um, 
she was surprised by that, even though we had encouraged her, please, please contact us at any time. We invited her if she ever wanted to share her story in person. Her, vo her voice was more powerful than anything that Lynn or I could share by far. She hasn't taken us up on that, but nevertheless, at, at six months and at 12 months, she was doing okay. She missed her husband, but she was doing okay. We haven't heard anything from her since that time. I was just gonna say this is an incredible discussion and I think meaningful to everyone in the room and their experiences as you wouldn't have had if you hadn't put this program in place. And I think that's one of the real messages is this sort of free, frees the healers to try and heal and not be inhibited to communicate with uh, people that we feel very empathetic. And I, and I think the situation is always put yourself in the patient's shoes and think how you would react in a similar circumstance and then figure out what it would take to make you feel better had you experienced what they're experiencing. But it's so, it's so moving and you know, I think we're all healers, we're all trying to do the right thing all the time and um, the thought that we've been told for many years you can't say, you can't talk, you can't communicate um, is so absolutely antithetical to everything we have trained to do and stand for. So to have your team up there talking about the common experiences and what you've been able to do is, uh, is truly extraordinary. Thank you very much, all of you. I think this is maybe a question for Linda, and I'm not sure I can articulate it well, but I'm thinking about the statement of both the family and the provider felt held and comforted through the process, and I'm wondering if they can ever coexist. Um, I'm wondering if there is ever, I'm trying to imagine um, trying to create empathy for a provider from the patient or family within the process and it feels like it's just way too much to ask um, and I'm wondering if it ever kind of co is there a role is it ever productive is it ever possible uh, or are they mutually exclusive you processes know, I, I don't know but you're talking to an anomaly because that's what happened in my case you know and, um, in 1999. I don't, I don't know if you know the story, but basically an anesthesiologist almost killed me. No, no, just a joke, but almost really he did. And then, um, but he reached out in 1999 and wrote me a letter in a time when that was unheard of mm -hmm. and, and, and extended something. But I wasn't ready because mm -hmm. I was in shock and denial just dealing with my kids and my husband. And, um, and uh, but when I was ready, he had, he had extended a hand and then I reached out to him. But I remember thinking, if I feel this bad, I can't imagine what he's feeling. And, and then I got to see other providers. So I had the ability to do that, but honestly, it's one of those, I think I was just wired that way. It's what my husband hates the most about me. <laughs> because I see everybody's side and it pisses him off because he only wants me to see his, his side. side. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but but I, I, think, I think we can get there, but to expect it, I think Joe Shapiro often says, don't expect, um, don't get your loving from the, from the patients. I think you can get there, you can create environments, but we've got a long way to go, you know? Um, I think it's taken 10 years for clinicians to, or for, the organizations to realize we need to support clinicians. You know, when I first started on this journey, I just thought, yeah, just tell the truth. And then when I started to talk at forums and hear from clinicians, I'd hear the struggle about, you know, privately they were being told by the insurance companies not to do it, even though, you know, that struggle, wanting to do the right thing but not being supported. So now I see this kind of model <laughs> as a, finally a blessing to uh, um, clinicians to be able to do the things that they wanted to do all along without the barriers. So and, uh, this hope. And I think I don't want to be supported by the family. I don't want that. I want that from right. my peers and, and recognition. And, and sometimes I get angry because, you know, I wasn't the one doing it. And I want to like, we're, we're, sometimes I want to blame whoever was involved. Um, but I think it's peer support. I need not. I, I think to me, it's too much to ask. It's like when you say to a family member, well, what could we have done better? Well, you know, right. that's my job. That's not you to tell, you know. So sometimes I think it's too much to put on them at, at that time. Maybe down the road it could potentially be. But I, initially, I think. Well, and, and that's how I would feel about yeah. it too, but I was also thinking of the comment of, um, I'm hurt and I want you to hurt too. Yes. And if that expression yes. of hurt is helpful 
or productive. What do you mean? From seeing, the provider. Yeah. Seeing them hurt? Yeah. Um, uh, I think, I think, yeah. Actually, when I saw my orthopedic surgeon, um, you know, three months later, cry about my event, and, and it was a quick cry, my first reaction was, holy shit, pull yourself together. What the hell are you doing? I was panicked because I had never seen anything like it, you know? And then, um, and then in that moment, I realized, oh my God, you know, he's hurting. I wondered if he was getting support, but then he quickly shut it down and left. And, and, and if I, I, as a patient, that was the first time, and it was three months after my event, that I, I, I saw that somebody gave a shit, you know? And I think that's, that's what a care program is going to do, is show the opposite of what we've been doing, that lack of communication, that not being told the truth, that, you know, um, Lucian always says, you know, you have a physical injury, but then, you know, there's an emotional injury, and we have to do that. And when we don't talk to patients, it's insult to injury. And that, that removes all this, and so there's opportunities. Thank you. You're truly extraordinary. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Hoagland Rosania. Um, I'm a very impressive uh, team. I'm an orthopedist, and um, I like to know, do, do folks have specialized training to sit on these types of uh, review processes, or what, 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 how does it all come about? I guess I'd answer that with yes and no. I think, I think this is part, uh, I think this is largely innate in us, and maybe it's that innateness that gets us into these roles. I think some of it's ex experiences, in my case, very much going through a malpractice suit shaped who I am and my perception of medicine and how I felt it needed to change. And then, you know, obviously there is you know, professional training in our, in our professional careers in healthcare quality and risk management that guides us. And this experience, Macrame care program is, is training and every patient family interaction is an opportunity to learn uh, and it's, it's ongoing. I think we've all had some kind of, you know, I've, we've been to difficult conversation courses. Me and Alex went to one which was very good. But I think what spares me is I'm English. I, I trained in the uh, National Health Service and I worked there for many years and then I come to a country where everybody's so concerned about being sued and, and somehow I always feel we forget about the patients and I, that is what always spares me on every day is that it's all about the patient and that's why we're here. It, it, one of the other okay. um, lessons that you, we learned from that is that the, we're, you know, we, we're a team, we've done a couple of cases together, we understand what each person's gonna say. The variable in the room is the physician and the patient, what the variables are. And um, that's why we have the, the pre-meeting with the physician, to, to help the physician yeah. walk through the process, to tell us what that physician would say to the patient, um, to, to listen to them and see if they're, they're coming across in an empathetic way. Um, so then, you know, the team reforms um, with, it, with each new event. And I would much rather do that with a clinician within the peer protected system than what, you know, quite honestly, Covaris and Crico do with physicians in preparation for trial. And in some cases, we'll decide that they're not going to let that case go to trial because that physician is not going to do well on the stand. I'd rather have um, a different kind of conversation and coaching a physician. We'll take, I think, one last question, Ken. And one last question, launch. Dr. Reese. Hi, I'm Helen Reese from MGH. I, I really just have a comment. Um, and that is um, when Dr. Woodward said that it's not rocket science, but caring is science. Um, you all are living proof that we cannot get away from the power of emotion. And when people have, when doctors are sued or have an adverse event, they suffer for years. And what you've just been living proof of is when you got this group together in a room, you all suffered for about two and a half hours. And it was palpable to everyone in this room that the emotions in that room were incredibly powerful. I think if most doctors knew that facing the patient, learning how to give an apology, however horrendously uncomfortable and awful that is, in a, an hour or an hour and a half or a team meeting as you had, they would trade away that hour and a half in a nanosecond compared to the 10, 15, 20 years of suffering that they have. Now, the neuroscience of empathy is a very robust field, and it has been widely studied with neuroimaging studies, and it's all over the neuroscience literature in psychology. A couple of years ago, I wrote a two-page article 
that was published in JAMA called The Neurobiology of Empathy. And I would like to cross the barrier from thinking that empathy is this soft thing over there and the big hard science is over there and invite everyone to understand that we need to learn how to teach people to be really attuned, that there is a science to this communication and it's our mandate to figure out how to teach it. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great closing remark. I, I think uh, we should all give a hand to this team uh, for this presentation. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I want to thank you all for participating in what's felt like a, to me like an amazing day. Uh, you know, I think that some of the themes of today are uh, vulnerability. Uh, there's vulnerability here. Uh, this team has talked a lot about being vulnerable, having to put yourself out there. Uh, I know I felt a little vulnerable today looking at our data uh, for uh, pretty much the first time and seeing, uh, uh, seeing that it's not perfect. Uh, so, and the other theme is that it's, it's a little messy. You know, uh, these conversations are messy. They take turns that you might not be uh, expecting. Uh, and the data is messy, but at least we can see, see it now. I'm sure it was messy before, and now we can, we can see the mess, uh, and, we, and we can make it better. Um, but it's also very human, and, uh, and you know, we're, we're in this business because we like the human side, and, uh, and we're getting it better at that, and we're doing the right thing. Uh, we have lunch planned, and then for those that want to stay, we have a really terrific opportunity to see uh, the film uh, that Mr. Kramen's been working on uh, about this field. And uh, that film is, uh, this is, this is a chance to see it uh, uh, in the phase where it's, it's near complete, but not, uh, uh, not entirely complete from what I understand. I'm, I'm seeing uh, him shake his head. It's not quite near complete, but it's, uh, uh, so you get to see, uh, you get, you get to see the work in process. Um, uh, I've, I've seen it, it's terrific, so I encourage you to attend. We do have a clip that we are going to show as we're closing things out. Um, uh, so people, uh, feel free uh, to, to leave now, uh, grab lunch if you're going to stay, and uh, you will get to see the video. If you are sitting there saying, I don't know what I'm gonna do, uh, watch the clip. It's going to give you a good idea of, uh, of what's, what's involved. Uh, but thank you all for coming today. It's been a terrific session. Can we queue it up?